like to uh, welcome everybody to Grand Rounds. Uh, Jason asked me to announce that next week is awards day, so we'll be over in the uh, CTR building, same time, eight o'clock, so uh, make sure everybody shows up for that. It's uh, a real pleasure to uh, have Dr. Steve Shedlowski, who's a professor of medicine in the GI section at the University of Kentucky, is our uh, Grand Round speaker today. I tried to get Jason to uh, change the background to red, but he couldn't get that done quickly. Um, so I've been actually trying to get Steve over here, as he knows, for the past year to give Grand Rounds uh, before one or both of us retires. And uh, Steve, uh, I'm especially fond of that in 1982, I went to uh, the University of Kentucky as the youngest and most naive uh, head of gastroenterology in the country, probably. And uh, so we're going through some faculty turnover here, but it was nothing like it was there at that time. So, um, I was basically the only clinical gastroenterologist. There was one older faculty member that didn't do much clinically. And so Steve was my first recruit and uh, we were uh, thrilled to have him in. And he was actually uniquely trained at the time that uh, he had hepatology training, which was uh, fairly rare at the time. And uh, Steve's internationally recognized for his expertise in porphyria. And you should thank us that he's not talking about that today, that uh, every, every, every uh, gastroenterologist I know crams before the boards to study for porphyria and then tries to forget it right away. And so even Dr. Marsano refers his porphyria patients to Steve. So uh, Steve is a regional referral person for porphyria. He also really was one of the first people to actively treat hepatitis C when it was actually difficult to treat in Kentucky. And he's the person that really instituted the treatment of hepatitis C in our prisons in Kentucky. And so we actually owe him a debt of gratitude for that. But uh, today, Steve is gonna talk about something that really impacts all medical practices. And uh, that's iron metabolism and iron overload, Steve. Thank you very much, Greg. I've always had an interest in iron, and often iron is uh, discussed mainly by hematologists. But as I'll try to show you today, hepatologists have also had a major interest in iron metabolism, and, and especially iron overload diseases. And I'll mention maybe one, one porphyrin during this talk. Let me see if I can, there you go. Now, Greg asked me to start this out with a case report. And so um, I found this patient who was a 48-year-old white gentleman who had hypertension, hyperlipidemia, obesity, and a little prediabetes. And he basically came in complaining of fairly severe and significant fatigue, arthralgias, and erectile dysfunction. Uh, he married a truck driver. He didn't smoke, which was somewhat unusual in Kentucky. But he drank a little bit of beer at night. These were his meds here, and he was uh, somewhat obese. Blood pressure was controlled relatively well. Head and neck exams were okay. Abdomen was benign. He had no hepatosplenomegaly, but really doing exams. Uh, we exams now are really have taken a second place to you know doing imaging and things like that. No cutaneous lesions or changes there. He had a normal CBC, but his platelet count was a little on the low side. His chem panel showed you know, a little non-fasting elevation of his glucose. Creatinine was okay, probably. But his transaminases were just a tad abnormal. And so uh, he ended up getting a workup for his elevated LFTs. We usually do the viral studies. And um, generally, also, when we do uh, the acute hepatitis panel, and that's often what consists of doing viral studies for a lot of people, uh, that doesn't usually tell you if they're immune to A or B, but uh, at least in my practice, I usually also try to check to see if they've got antibody to surface antigen and uh, antibody um, uh, to Hep A. And he had no immunity, and that's not 
too surprising. He was born, if he was 48, I guess, in 1970. And we've had a, an effective vaccine for Hep B since uh, 1981. But we don't tend to vaccinate people or worry about it. And we see a whole lot of acute Hep B in patients, you know, who are adults and who, uh, you know, might be using drugs or sexual transmission. Well, at any rate, he was negative. His uh, serologic studies were negative. His alpha-1 antitrypsin phenotype was normal. And I usually recommend when you're checking alpha-1 antitrypsin, don't order the level. Order the phenotype because you want that information too, and they give you the level when you order the phenotype. But that was normal. But his ferritin was fairly high, and he, uh, his iron study showed that he was uh, uh, transferrin saturated was greater than 98%. So they checked his HFE mutation, and he was a C282Y homozygous, and we'll talk about that more in the next slide, few slides. So we decided to do a non-contrast abdominal CT scan. And the problem was he had already developed cirrhosis and a hepatoma. And this non-contrast study shows uh, you know, uh, iron, because iron is dense. And he had a lot of iron in his liver, and he had already developed a hepatoma. Now, iron has been considered uh, important in a lot of pathophysiologic situations, but it's been very, very controversial. And even though iron deficiency Iron deficiency is much more common than iron overload. It's kind of been considered that as we age, we accumulate more iron, and that it might play an important role in neurodegenerative diseases, cancer, cardiovascular diseases, and inflammation and infection, mainly because invading microbes and fungi need iron for their growth. And so, and then there are these genetic disorders. But uh, it, and one of the theories uh, was that maybe men don't live as long as women because they tend to have a little more iron on board. But those kinds of theories have not always held up, and it's been a lot of, been very controversial, you know, in terms of how iron plays into these different uh, disorders. Now, talking about what iron does in the body, I think most of this is probably, uh, you know, old hat to you. But iron in the body is mainly uh, sequestered as heme. This is my only uh, porphyria uh, mention. This molecule here, protoporphyrin-9, then allows iron, uh, which has a, the ability to oxidize and reduce, to give up and accept an electron very easily. And so it's very important in all these energy-generating oxidation reactions, all the mitochondrial cytochrome heme, the P450s, all these other oxidases, and of course, for oxygen and uh, carriage and hemoglobin and myoglobin. But the quirk of evolution is that when all these energy generating systems were developing on Earth, it was an oxygen poor environment. And all that iron was actually very, it was in the reduced state, in the ferrous state, very water soluble, very bioavailable. And so all these uh, energy generating systems evolved in that environment. But then they started generating oxygen, and when the environment became oxygen rich, that ferrous iron was actually kind of reactive and dangerous because it could oxidize things so easily. But, and it became ferric iron, the oxidized form, is very insoluble in aqueous environments, but because uh, life forms needed the iron, it was very critical for these uh, energy generating uh, reactions, but it was bio and available, and therefore far too precious to give up. So once iron gets into your body, very hard, there's no mechanism to excrete excess iron. Now, iron in the body, as I said, is mainly in the iron of hemoglobin and myoglobin, the vast majority. And the enzymes that we're talking about that are so important for life actually, you know, it's a tiny, uh, less than, you know, 3.3% uh, of all the iron. So if you become iron deficient, these enzymes are not going to be compromised at all. Instead, you'll probably develop iron deficient anemia. And there's a significant amount of storage iron, and men usually have a little more iron in their bodies than women. And it's between, three, you know, a little more, about four grams of total iron the body. But you only, of all that 
four grams of iron, 4,000 milligrams of iron, we tend to lose about one to two milligrams per day. And the only place where the iron enters the body normally is in the proximal duodenum. And you of about 10 to 15 uh, grams of iron that we ingest in our diet, maybe one to two milligrams per day are absorbed. But that, as we'll talk about in a few more slides, can be adjusted a little bit. Not a lot, but a little bit, a few milligrams a day one way or the other. And then these are all, again, you know, uh, the places where the iron is located. Now, back in the old days, this is a very old slide. Probably this slide is uh, older than many of you in the audience. Uh, we used to think of really just two major proteins involved. That was transparin. That was well studied. And it was interesting. It was a single molecule, but it had places for two irons to be uh, picked up and carried around. And it transports iron in the serum. And once one iron is put on, the avidity for the second site seems to increase. So most of the iron that we, most of the transparin that's saturated in our system tends to be diferic transparent. And there's probably very little monoferric transparent. And then the other important molecule <coughs> was this molecule ferritin that was known. And it was a large molecule that could store thousands of atoms of iron. And they probably weren't stored on the outside. They were probably stored within uh, the, uh, uh, you know, sort of a, a, a sphere of the ferritin. <coughs> And again, about four grams of iron uh, total in the body. This pie chart is probably not accurate. Uh, and one unit of blood, about 500 mLs of blood, contains about 250 milligrams of iron. But, so that was ferritin and transferrin <coughs> in the old system, was a simple way of looking at iron. But we've since discovered a ton of new important iron metabolism protein. So on the next two slides, I want to go through those and then uh, show how they actually uh, act. Now here's the transparent that I talked about. And again, it's usually a diferic transparent, but it's normally only about 30% uh, saturated with iron. The rest is floating around as apotransparent, and it carries iron. Another protein here, again, that comes, and by the way, transparent comes from the liver. And it can be an acute phase reaction, too, which can complicate things during a, a, you know, acute injury. The ruloplasmin is a copper-containing protein. It's not a copper uh, carrier protein. In fact, the job of the ruloplasmin is to make sure there's no ferrous iron floating around doing damage. And it has ferrioxidase activity to make sure there's no dangerous ferrous iron floating around. Now the transferrin receptor is a protein that's on every cell in the body, has to have a transferrin receptor, because every cell in the body needs iron. And it gets the iron by having this dimer take iron uptake, and then uh, we'll talk about how it's uh, regulated in a second. And it tends to be a recycled from the endosome to the surface of the cell, as I'll show you in the uh, next slide or two. Here's that ferritin molecule, again, large. It stores that excess iron to protect the cell. And its messenger RNA is also regulated. And it's regulated uh, both the transferrin receptor ferritin and a lot of other proteins that I'll talk about by something called iron responsive elements on the messenger RNA for these proteins. And uh, I point out that serum ferritin is not a carrier protein for iron. And even though when we have a lot of iron in our body, the ferritin goes up, and we'll talk about that, it's not a carrier protein for iron. It's actually iron poor. And I think the best way to think about serum ferritin is that it reflects the sort of activity within the RE system of uh, iron being turned over. And if there's a lot of iron in the body being turned over, well, more ferritin is going to be made, and it leaks out of these uh, macrophages. And so it reflects total body iron stores. And then finally on this slide, I talk about two other proteins that are called the iron responsive proteins one and two. And they bind to these iron responsive elements on all of these messenger RNAs as a function of how much iron there is in the cell. And it also happens to be responsive to oxygen levels in the body and even nitric oxide. Now the next set of proteins have to do with cell transport. 
And what we're talking here is the two proteins that are on the apical surface of the duodenal enterocyte that's trying to absorb the iron. And this D site B is a ferry reductase because I said most of the iron that comes in in our diets and all that is ferric iron. Well, in order to absorb it, it has to be reduced to ferrous iron so this divalent metal transporter on the apical membrane can take it into the body. The DMT1 also transports other metal cations like zinc. The other two proteins are this protein on the basolateral membrane, and they're responsible for exporting the iron out of that enterocyte and into the body and loading it onto this apotransparent. And that's very important, and it's the only iron exporter that we have in mammalian cells. And then a protein called hyphestin, which is a, a ferry oxidase, very much like ceruloplasm, and it contains copper, and it helps load that ferric iron onto the apotransparent. And then hepcidin is, uh, you know, uh, a protein that has been discovered now to be that master regulator of iron absorption by the duodenal enterocyte. But it has effects throughout the body, and it's actually uh, was a, 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 a small peptide that was discovered to have antimicrobial activity. And the key thing that we'll talk about with hepcidin is that it increases the turnover of ferry port. The last protein I want to mention on this slide is a protein that was discovered to be mutated in this disorder, hemochromatosis, or HFE hemochromatosis. And it turns out, uh, for a long time, we couldn't figure out how the HFE mutation ended up causing issues with increased iron absorption. There are all sorts of theories about how, where it was in the apical, you know, or, or, you know, on the enterocyte, and none of it seemed to make any sense. But it was known that that was a protein that was mutated in most forms of iron overload that we saw. Now, going back to how iron uh, is uh, uh, metabolized in the body or handled in the body, again, here's the diferic transparent taken up by the transparen receptor, that dimer glassman coated pits, and you'll notice it has a, a DMT1 on it. It forms this endosome, and then into the endosome, there are these proton pumps, again, just like in the parietal cell, to pump acid into the stomach. Well, every cell has these proton pumps that pro, uh, can pump that acid into these particular endosomes, and by acidifying uh, the iron, you reduce it. It's released from the apotrans from the apotransparent, and then the DMT1 basically pumps it into the body. And then, of course, the cell uses mechanisms to protect itself uh, from any ferrous iron, but pumps it into the mitochondria or stores it as ferritin. And the way this is regulated is that the, when the cell needs iron, well, it doesn't need ferritin to, to store it, doesn't need very important to pump it out of the cell, so that iron responsive protein sits on the five prime portion of the uh, messenger RNA for these proteins and represses the translation. On the other hand, on the three prime end of uh, uh, proteins like the transferrin receptor and the dimethyl uh, divalent metal transporter, this ends up stabilizing the message so the protein gets made. Now, once iron comes into the cell, it turns out that these iron-responsive iron proteins, they only have three iron sulfur molecules. And that fourth iron causes it to lose its affinity for that iron. And suddenly, the proteins like ferritin and very important, sorry, wrong way. Suddenly, they are translated within minutes, and, the, and then uh, when the IRBP loses the affinity for the three prime end of these proteins, they now are degraded, so the cell doesn't need to take in any more iron or pump it into the cell at all. Now, the other proteins that we're talking about here, and this is, again is a very old slide from uh, Nancy Andrews, that talks about, again, she, this was this was called just a ferry oxidase in this, so it's now called D site B, and it's uh, 
it will reduce that ferric iron so DMT1 can either store it as ferritin or it goes through ferriport and is loaded then onto the uh, apotransferrin after it is uh, then reoxidized by the uh, protein called hyphestin. A few years later, she uh, kind of gussied up that, uh, uh, you know, that, that mechanism a little bit, and so it's a little fancier. But I'm showing this slide because it's also known that heme iron is actually absorbed much more uh, uh, readily than the ferric iron or ferrous iron in our diet. And even though this is probably already, this is an old slide now, uh, we probably do know more about these. It, it, at the time, and I've, I've not kept up with whether or not we know whether or not the heme actually gets all the way across the membrane or what exactly happens to it. It may be degraded and the iron saved. That's what happens when heme is degraded. And whether it gets into the cell or not isn't important. But heme iron is uh, absorbed more avidly and readily than uh, elemental iron. So the iron absorption, about 10 to 20 milligrams, only a milligram or two are absorbed. That complex bioavailability, so in the diet, if you have like egg proteins, phosphates, phytates, they decrease absorption, but ascorbic acid and acid in general will help keep that iron as ferrous iron and increase of absorption. But the regulation, again, is at that entero, at the enterocyte level, either loaded onto apotransferrin or it's stored as ferritin, and the enterocytes only live five to seven days, and you slough them off. And so you lose the iron to the body. So how the cell, how that enterocyte senses the need for iron is then based on this hepcidin very important active. So the central role of hepcidin is that it's a 25 uh, amino acid peptide, but it's made by this hemp gene, which codes for an 84 amino acid free propeptide that's then processed and excreted. And in evolution, Epsidin had this antimicrobial activity mainly by denying iron to invading microbes. And it accomplishes this in higher organisms by increasing the degradation of ferriportin, thereby keeping iron within the cell and unavailable for the invading microbe. And ferriportin is the only iron exporter that we know about. It's uh, uh, coded by this particular gene. And so the key point here is that the lack of adequate hepcidin leads to this unfettered ferriportin activity and transport of iron into the body. And that's how things work. And so this also explains something that we uh, kind of noticed over the years that a lot of alcoholic liver disease, hep C patients, a lot of fatty liver disease often have a little bit of extra iron, tend to have high, a little higher ferritin than normal. And it's probably because that liver injury has somehow affected the amount of hepcidin that's subsequently secreted, and that leads to mild iron overload. Now, I bring in here, here's that enterocyte, uh, again, with the iron coming in or the heme coming in, and that very important. Uh, but I also introduced the macrophage, because remember, the RE system handles far more iron and iron turnover than the mucosal enterocyte. So this is a very important player in the handling of iron in the body. And again, it's very important here. But then the hepcidin here uh, binds to the very important and then leads to its degradation. So the amount of hepcidin then regulates the amount of very important. Now again, going back in the old times, uh, looking at iron disease was you either had genetic or so-called primary iron overload or, you know, it's secondary, and most of this was transfusional. I won't really talk a lot about post -tran you know, transfusional iron overload. And then some of these other uh, disorders that were considered secondary. They weren't the genetic, you know, iron overload. But again, things are much more complicated. And the historical point here is that this, F this gene mutation, it, it, was, it wasn't discovered until 1996. But we knew it was on uh, chromosome 6, and it was an HLA-type protein. We knew it was homozygous recessive inheritance. And what was uh, unusual is that it was known to be very, very common. In northern European population, one out of every 250 to 400 people had the genetic were autosomal recessive for it. 
And heterozygotes were very common, 6 to 8 percent, sometimes up to 10 to 14 percent of patients in, uh, of northern European extract, in fact, had, had the uh, genetic, uh, were heterozygotes for the mutation. But what was also noted was that only about 1 percent of people who were homozygous actually had any kind of phenotypic expression of the disease. So even though the gene is common, the disorder is actually still very rare. And now let's get real complicated here, but let's talk about how then HFE fits in. And it turns out this is the HFE, this is where it is, and there are all these other iron regulators, bone morphogenic proteins, and all these other things that are either iron signals, or bone marrow signals, or inflammation signals that lead through this MAD pathway to the hepcidin gene or HAMP gene uh, expression. So there's very complex regulation. And that probably explains why the penetrance of the homozygous uh, C2A2Y is, so, uh, is so rare. And then the liver then has this more or less a sensing mechanism. So this is that complex on the surface of the liver cell. And then this is diaphragmic transparent. And then this is bone morphogenic protein, which is uh, you know, an inflammatory marker that could come from the endothelial cell, the sinusoidal endothelial cell with its fenestrations there, or the Kupfer cell or the stellate cell that can all affect then this hepcidin uh, expression. And so Pietrangelo, Antonello Pietrangelo, has uh, looked at hemochromatosis really as either something where you pump a little more iron into the body that you need, and we won't talk much about these at all, but he likes to look at these sort of in a, in a, uh, um, in, in, in a gradient in that uh, when you have this particular common mutation, it's autosomal recessive and you get iron influx into parenchymal cells, but it's kind of late disease, it's a, you know, a clinical onset is late, and it's usually very mild, although it can be severe. There's also a transferrin receptor 2 mutation. Uh, we don't do these mutational analysis. We only really do the HFE mutation analysis. But I think it, they can be done. But uh, he looks at these different mutations as having different effects. And uh, if you have a defect in the uh, hepcidin anti Probial peptide, the HAMP gene, that tends to be very severe then, you know, and you get iron overload very, very early. Also, this HFE2 or the hemoduvulin mutation, again, autosomal recessive, very severe early iron overload, and you get all sorts of other problems with uh, hypogonadism, cardiomyopathy, and arthritis, by the way, and I'm not sure why he didn't put arthritis on here. This gain of function and very important here in this team can lead to very, you know, uh, late mild uh, increase, but this is not the HAM gene now. This is a very important gene, and it's a gain of function. In other words, it, I think what happens is that hepcidin cannot cause its degradation, and it tends to be autosomal uh, dominant, but again, fairly mild, and we don't have time really to talk about actual very important disease, the loss of function, and some of these other very rare and complex forms of iron overlay. And he liked to look at the phenotypic continuum. So if you have these mutations, you get lots of iron overload very early that affect the pancreas and the heart. Later on, it tends to be hepatic fibrosis, pancreatic iron, and diabetes, hepatocellular carcinoma, things like that. So the historical, more of the historical you know, information about hereditary HFE hereditary hemochromatosis is that they would see these rare patients with massive iron overload. And a lot of these very famous uh, clinicians and pathologists would describe these and, and had, you know, papers and it wasn't really understood. Uh, but that HLA, uh, you know, linkage, the A3 linkage was sort of what often we did. We'd often get HLA typing. <clears throat> but then, um, Better and Bacon and a number of others in 1996 published this paper where they described the particular HFE mutation. The mutations in these other things were described later. But why is the gene so common, especially in Northern European? 
It was thought that, you know, and if you read the, uh, the gurus, the hepatology gurus who write about iron metabolism and hemochromatosis, uh, they basically say it must have been survival advantage. Uh, you weren't as, women weren't as likely to die in childbirth if they had iron on board and could make more blood, <coughs> or if you got bored by a saber-toothed tiger. And so it was just considered kind of protection against iron deficiency. But uh, Sharon Mualam, uh, in 2004, posited that maybe it was the Black Plague, and that kind of goes along with the Northern European, uh, uh, you know, uh, 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 you know, expression of uh, hemochromatosis. And uh, the theory that uh, Moalem uh, purported was there was no iron in the macrophage to support the growth of the Yersinia pestis, so these patients wouldn't get buboes and die, and so they were selected out that way. <laughs> But it's very interesting that it's not currently acknowledged by any of the gurus. You know, uh, if you read Paul Adams' review or Petrangelo's review, this is not mentioned. And I thought initially, well, this must be because, uh, you know, these are old men, you know, they, this is Sharon Mullum, some woman who, you know, has no cred at all. And I could never figure out, he even tried to ask Paul Adams at a liver meeting uh, a few years ago, and he kind of ran away from me. I, but frankly, there's something fishy going on here. So I, I Googled Sharon Moalam to see if I could get more information. And first of all, this is not a woman. Sharon Moalam is a man. He's a Canadian physician who kind of goes public. He's, I don't know, maybe like a Canadian uh, Dr. Oz or something like that. But I don't know if you know this theory is really true or not. It really sounds good. But there's still something fishy, and I haven't been able to figure out why, why this isn't at least addressed. And maybe, uh, and, I, and there have been studies, you know, uh, trying to look at hemochromatosis macrophages versus normal and things like that. But I have not been able to figure out why this theory at least isn't addressed. And this is the HFE protein, and this is from that 1996 article. And the key thing here is this mutation is where beta-2 microglobulin. Uh, binds to the protein. And all HLA proteins, as you probably know or may not know, require beta-2 microglobulin as a chaperone to take the protein to the surface of the cell. And so this was why the, this mutation ended up causing the HFE not to be working. And the H63D mutation wasn't really quite sure how that uh, worked out. So now, if we're trying to figure out if somebody has the HFE hemochromatosis, we measure the C282Y, and it turns out it's actually a fairly easy assay to do. You uh, just need one restricted nuclease, and you do your, P you, you, you know, extract the DNA, you, you know, uh, do your PCR, and you run out the thing, and, it, it, and if you either get a normal, a heterozygote, or a homozygous pattern, and it's just one fell swoop. And so we actually, at UK, we do that as an in-house in uh, assay. We don't even have to send it out. It doesn't cost anything. There's no you know, patent on it or anything like that. And it's really only the C282Y mutation that's important and that puts you at risk of iron overload. Turns out the H63D mutation is very common. It's almost 40% of Europeans have it. And if you're homozygous for this, there's absolutely no risk of iron overload. So we don't check for H63D unless there's a C282Y, because the compound heterozygotes do have some increased risk of iron overload, but it's much lower. Now getting to what iron does in the body, and if you thought I was going to actually give you the biochemical or molecular mechanism for how iron causes, I really can't do that as a molecular or biochemist. Iron just causes, in the spare, it causes increased lipid peroxidation. And if it's in the pituitary gland, it can cause decreased gonadotropins. It can increase melanocyte stimulating hormone. Skin bronzing, very unusual. But it's a cardiomyopathy, mainly conduction disorders. Cirrhosis, liver cell cancer, diabetes, bacteremia, of course, because you have more iron in the body. And because of the gonadotropins, you can get testicular atrophy. Arthropathy in pseudogout is important. And generally, the way it works is that you start increasing iron absorption from birth. But it takes years and years 
then serum iron, hepatic iron, tissue injury, and you finally get end organ damage and hepatoma. And because before we had the HFE testing to do, what we used to do is do liver biopsies on everybody and calculate what's called the hepatic iron index. And it's just the liver iron in the micromoles per gram dry weight of liver divided by the age in years. And if it was above two or so here, it was likely that you had you know, the genetic hemochromatosis. Heterozygotes down here and pre-cirrhotic and cirrhotic homozygotes up here. And alcoholic liver disease, you know, in normals were, you know, maybe a little up here, but, you know, uh, again, very mildly increased. And if we want to interpret uh, ferritin levels, you really need to do it with iron levels, too. And you really want to uh, not just measure an iron level, you want to measure the percent of transferrin that saturates. So it's really the percent transferrin saturation. And at least at UK, we can order a total iron binding capacity. And you get, you know, the transferrin, you get the iron, you get the TIBC, and we give you the percent transferrin saturation. I think at the VA, I was told by one of my fellows that if you order the TIBC and you don't order the iron, they only give you the amount of iron that can be bound. They don't really give you the percent transferrin saturation. But it's the percent transferrin saturation that you want. And if the ferritins increase, and along with the percent transferrin saturation, well, could be hemochromatosis. But again, that could be acute liver injury. So I also tell my uh, residents, don't try to order iron studies in the face of like acute liver injury. If the transaminases are high, that ferritin is going to be in percent transferrin. They're uninterpretable. So don't even bother. Uh, and if uh, the ferritin's high, but you have a low SAT, it's probably an acute illness. This is normal. And if you have a low ferritin and low percent trans, that, that is iron deficiency. And back in the old days, again, what we used to do is just do the iron and ferritin. And, you know, if you've got a high SAT or high ferritin, well, then maybe you'll do the HFE. And so I modified this old slide, put in HFE testing. In the old days, we'd kind of go to the liver biopsy and look at the, you know, uh, uh, iron index or look at stainable iron. Another way to do it is, you know, a lot of patients don't want to get a needle stuck in their liver. And so you just start phlebotomy therapy. And if they're iron deficient after one or two units, well, you know, they weren't iron overload. And you don't have to biopsy them if they're kind of young, ferritin's not that high, and everything is otherwise pretty normal. And actually, phlebotomizing patients, doing therapeutic phlebotomies, is not a big deal. It's donating blood. But Dr. Pietrangelo uh, likes to complicate things. And so he puts this huge algorithm in here that I show you, actually only to show that you know, he's taking a look at different potential scenarios in which you, know, you might want to check iron. He actually doesn't have even in here really, you know, this, un, uh, you know, just abnormal LFT. And he should. He says unexplained cirrhosis. But he should have put, like, just elevated LFTs. You might want to do this, too. The majority of patients with iron overload will have mildly elevated uh, uh, transaminases. And then you go through this. And as complicated as it, as it is, basically, if you look, the therapy is always phlebotomy. You just get iron out of the body. One unit of blood has 250 milligrams of iron, and there you are. So the treatment is really fairly straightforward. But what isn't really well recognized or even mentioned in any of the reviews of hemochromatosis treatment, but which I think is kind of simple to do, you can uh, just give patients uh, PPI therapy, get rid of uh, gastric acid. In Hutchinson, uh, from uh, uh, from King's uh, a Hospital uh, uh, in London, England, published a nice little paper looking at hemochromatosis patients. And uh, by putting them on a meprazole, you were able to decrease their need for uh, phlebotomy therapy by about 20, uh, 60%. And they actually did an iron absorption type study where they gave them uh, iron and then measured how much got into the uh, serum. And again, that was also decreased by acid reduction. But the mainstay of therapy is still phlebotomy therapy. 
And the standard therapy was, if you read in literature, is like uh, a unit a week. And some uh, reviews even said, oh, you have to even go more than that, two units a week. I think it's crazy. You know, I, I think a much more humane way to go is uh, uh, throw a unit out once every two weeks. You make sure they're on a high-protein diet. You might folate supplement. You have them avoid vitamin C and, of course, iron supplements, including multivitamins with iron. And so you tell your patients if they're taking multivitamins and they're iron, make sure that you uh, get one a day for men or sent from silver or something like that that doesn't have iron in it. And, and that's fairly easy to do these days. You check the CBC uh, every other week, maybe ferritins every three months. This isn't hard and fast. You, it's sort of how you feel. But you don't want to make the patient anemic. There's no need to make the patient anemic and tired. And sometimes that happens. Uh, I always thought the ferritin of 50 uh, was kind of a, a good target. And I sort of just kind of pulled that out and used to say that that, and then, but I noticed a lot of other published literature kind of now mentions 50 uh, nanograms per mil as a target, and so I think that just makes sense. And then maintenance phlebotomies, you know, you just uh, do as many as you need to keep the ferritin less than 50 or around 50, and their blood is perfectly good and can be used, but you should be aware that with the HIV uh, scare in the 90s and all that, a lot of uh, blood centers were not happy about using blood that was gained by therapeutic phlebotomy, even though the blood is perfectly good. And hemochromatosis patients were, you know, great blood donors. You know, they were uh, lauded and awarded, and they were loved by the blood centers. They suddenly were persona non grata. All of a sudden, if you had to have the blood drawn for therapeutic reasons, your blood was somehow uh, tainted. And so even to this day, when they give a unit of blood, if it's from a hemochromatosis patient, by law it has to be listed as, uh, I don't know why. Uh, the other problem here is that if you have a fatty liver patient who you want to have the iron because they have a high ferritin, do not send them for a therapeutic phlebotomy. Have them go as volunteer blood donors. Because once you write that order, that have the blood drawn, they cannot use the blood and that patient can never become a volunteer, which is, again, crazy, but those are the rules. So you tell your patient, go donate blood, but don't tell them you send it. Now, the results of phlebotomy are really, if, whoops, goes too fast. Yeah, the, uh, if you prevent iron overload, all clinical manifestations are uh, helped. And reversible is thought that the cardiac dysfunction, diabetes, and skin pigmentation, which is very rare, can be reversible. It was considered irreversible cirrhosis, although I'm, I think it's a little, it's not quite that straightforward. Arthropathy, not as easily reversed, and the hypogonadism, and, and, and the risk of uh, liver cell cancer seems to kind of stick with even the iron patient. But clearly, it's been shown that the ironing improves survival rate. Now, this is uh, my only real slide on transfusional siderosis. If you put iron into the body with blood and these patients need to be transfused, you develop severe cardiac disease and arthritis, as most of you know. Classic chelation was deferoxamine or desferol. Uh, I don't think that brand is uh, available in the U.S. anymore. But it chelates iron and allows urinary excretion. And you can get out maybe 20 or 30 milligrams of iron per day in the urine. That's sort of the limit. And you can use it IM. I found out that when I looked at Hippocrates the other day. But you, uh, classically, it was a little mini pump that would just kind of pump it in during the, you know, either during sleep or during the whole day. And you would individualize the dose. And if you could get the patient to comply with it, you had a lot less organ damage. But there was a lot of neurologic toxicity, visually and or auditory. Now, we've come up with oral agents that are much easier to you know, use clinically. But XJ, uh, Deferazerox, or JADNU, another uh, brand of it, uh, can be used. And there's also Deferopone or Feriprox. But significant renal, liver, and neurologic toxicities can ensue. So you really have to watch these patients. You monitor their ferritin, and a lot of these patients, you'll be able to get their ferritins like 
down to three or four thousand, you know, or something like that. But sometimes, you know, a lot of these patients, if you measure their ferritin, they're uh, beyond, you know, their 12, 15,000, you know, uh, they're incredibly high. And, but you, you know, you have to use these very carefully, but you have to use them. Otherwise, these transfusional patients do get into trouble with iron overload. So let's uh, revisit this case again. He had HFE hemochromatosis. Unfortunately for him, it was diagnosed late. It caused the symptoms of fatigue and arthralgias and ED. And unfortunately for him, it did lead to cirrhosis and then a hepatoma. Now, his alcohol use may have worsened the iron overload, and maybe also his uh, fatty, maybe he had fatty liver disease too. So, uh, the liver cell cancer options are going to have to be addressed for him. And whether or not to de iron him with therapeutic phlebotomy really kind of depends on his overall prognosis. But again, uh, if, if the uh, um, uh, hemoglobin hematocrit can tolerate it, you know, doing phlebotomy therapy, uh, you know, works. And a lot of hemochromatosis patients will tell you they feel better after phlebotomy. And I have a few patients that, you know, I have to, you know, have to, uh, you know they, they become anemic. They, you know, they, they want far too many phlebotomies than their body needs. But, you know, I, and I have to try to get them to decrease their phlebotomy schedule so they don't become anemic. Because you don't want to start giving them iron. And then the other thing here is that you probably ought to make sure that siblings are checked for iron overload. Because they're at risk for having the same mutation. And it's interesting, children are not really at risk for anything. They're just obligate heterozygous that probably don't mean much. And, and unless the wife maybe, you know, has one chance in 15. but uh, I remember there was a, uh, I, I think it was a, a, a Grey's Anatomy episode where they discovered, they, they did an illicit autopsy. And they didn't get into trouble because the person who did the illicit autopsy discovered that the patient who they thought was alcoholic was massively iron overloaded. And so that protected the children. So they could give the information to the children so the children wouldn't get angry and do them. And I thought, well, I don't think the writers understood the genetics here of hemochromatosis. But at any rate, so I think I will stop right there and uh, ask if you have any questions. You're welcome. Well, I think it's probably because of that really complex uh, regulation of hepcidin that I showed you all those different molecules that are somehow involved. And so even if you don't have enough HFE there, there are other things that are going to be regulating the amount of hepcidin. Now, whether or not they've actually kind of looked at that to see where the hemochromatosis patients, uh, the gen uh, genetic homozygotes, have much more hepcidin than the ones who are iron overloaded. I don't know if that study's been done. It seems like it would, should have been done, but I have not seen that. But that is probably, and, and even the hepcidin, there may be a difference in the very important of affinity or the way the hepcidin can decrease it. So there's so many places for regulation to be altered or balanced that I think that's probably why, you know, um, it's so disparaged. And, and there are a lot of genetic diseases. Oh, okay, I get to mention porphyria. The porphyrias, you know, people who have the genetic mutation for porphyria, only about two to three percent of them end up having acute porphyric attack. You know, it's uh, again, when you have very complex biochemical regulation, again, it's more than just the genetic mutation. There are all these epigenetic, you know, uh, 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 factors that are probably important that we don't yet understand. And that's what Pete Crangelo, and it's interesting, uh, when they discovered the hemochromatosis HFE gene, I actually sent two of my patients, uh, sent their blood to be part of that study. I think there were like 80 patients studied. And uh, one did have the HFE mutation, the other one didn't. You know, and uh, 
it's probably some of these other genes that are involved. Yeah, you got a hard question there, Steve. <laughs> well, I think most of the time it's a conduction defect. And uh, in general, most of the time, unless you're massively iron overloaded, we generally, and, and unless there's some overt cardiac issue, you know, the cardiac uh, stuff for, for HFE hemochromatosis is fairly rare, where it's really important are in the kidneys. And not being a pediatrician, I'd probably defer if there are any pedi uh, pediatricians out there in terms of if you ha see any of these very rare, you know, hemojuvulin or hemp, uh, you know, where you get massive iron overload of children, you know, uh, I I'm sure those patients sent to cardiologists, but apparently as a cardiologist, you haven't seen them. I think they're just very rare. But in the uh, older patients, you've got an adult with iron overload and ferritin of like 1,500 or something like that. Most of the time, we don't, you know, do a big cardiac workup. So, Steve, we see a ton of NASH patients yeah. that um, have a ferritin of 800 mm -hmm. and maybe they're heterozygote for 282. Mm -hmm. So, what do you do? Is that important, not important? Do you well, sure, it's important. You send them to the, you make them a volunteer blood donor yeah. and do not. <laughs> Do not write a therapeutic phlebotomy order. I have five patients who every year I have to sit and write their little thing and I fax it to the blood center and maybe it'll get there. Maybe you want it's just extra work that's not necessary. And I even asked the, uh, uh, the person who, the pathologist who runs the blood center, why, why can't, could you please make Mr. Smith a volunteer blood donor instead of making me write the order? And he said, oh, no, no, the FDA requires that we uh, that you do this. Once, once we uh, uh, phlebotomize somebody at the, for therapeutic reasons, uh, their blood is, you know, we can't use it. And it's like, that makes no sense at all. Um, but that so, I think so, is possible. So if they have elevated liver enzymes, so will the blood center not exclude them because of that? Or No, not? they don't no. check those. Okay. And, uh, and what's interesting, as with hep C, usually when you de-iron patients who have mildly elevated ferritins, the transaminases usually uh, improve or normalize. I saw that with hep C for years and years. I used to phlebotomize all my hep C patients who are iron overloaded. So phlebotomy is easy. Uh, I had somebody tell me once, oh, phlebotomy, man, it's such a big procedure, it's so expensive. I'm saying, what? <laughs> it's not expensive. Actually, some places they do come in for a phlebotomy and they charge for it. But in the Kentucky Blood Center, they do it for free, you know, and, uh, and the patients still get a T-shirt, which is important. One last question. Oh, I usually just check a ferritin every year. Yeah, and uh, if they're, you know, stable and all that, sometimes you'll increase it from every two months to every, you know, uh, or decrease it every two months to every three months, depending upon their ferritin and their CBC and stuff like that. It, it's it's not really rock. It's really easy to manage these. Steve, thank you very much, and we have a special present for you <laughs> that uh, we try and put one of these uh, in every office over at UK. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Craig. It was a pleasure. And re remember again next week. It's uh, Ward's Grand Round, so it's over at the CTR building again at 8 o'clock. Thank you. Okay. Hope that went all right. Thanks. Thanks, Oh, good. Okay. Huh?